Welcome to what is becoming an incredibly popular session here at the AFM. Uh, we've been working with Largo, I believe, um, four or five years, excluding the pandemic, which felt like 10 years. Um, and they're an incredibly innovative company. Um, I've, and I intimately know Sammy Arpi, who is the owner of the company. Um, and it's amazing what AI is doing, not just to this business, many positive things, which his company does. Um, obviously, there are some negatives. But in this case, this is more of a positive thing, looking at forecasting, helping with your, you know, with your casting. Um, so that is really what their um, um, you know, technology does. So today, I know there's a, a few um, people here who've been pre-selected to present. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Brevin Warren, who is the moderator today. Super briefly, because I want to leave all of the time for you, is I am here because I recently published a dissertation on the value of independent filmmakers from a financial engineering perspective. So this aligns with predictive analysis for investors and investor modeling. What's exciting about today, which I am so delighted for, is that we're going to be looking at key predictors for story and cast for amazing original IP. And so how that is, what it means for you, for creative producers, for investors, for distributors, sales agents, is that you get to be making more informed decisions based on data to determine your involvement in productions. So what that looks like, how all of this works, I get to introduce Sammy Arpa, who his creativity and his visionary computer science allows him to, because of his experience as a director, uniquely position himself to be building future forward solutions for the entertainment industry. And so without further ado, Sammy, I am so excited for you to explain how we're gonna be looking at this and what it's gonna look like so then we can run through and I can give most of the time to the creators who are pitching their extraordinary projects, all of which I would love to produce. Please talk to me afterwards. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to the session. So firstly, thank you to AFM, Robin. It's great to make this partnership several years and bringing AI to the stage together with very strong projects that you will see today, 20 of them. And so you will see the projects in a specific style. Uh, we bring some of the AI results uh, to the screen while the producers are pitching their projects. So I want to give you a few information about that so that you have a better idea how to read this information. Uh, so here you see an example project uh, uh, that you will see for other projects as well in that format. You will see a genre analysis mapping that you see on the uh, left, top left corner. That shows from start till the end of the film how different genres are evolving over the story. So that gives a, a great idea about the style positioning of the content. And just below that, you see the character relationship maps. Here, the size of circles uh, indicate uh, indicates the importance of the characters and the thickness of edges between the circles that shows the level of interaction between the characters. And you'll see also lead actor that had an AI match calculated, uh, which is calculated by uh, considering the previous performances of these actors and their relevance to the characters inside the story. And on the right side, you see some scores that, is, that, is, that are some new features, actually. We have re released uh, just two months ago as Largo AI version 2. Uh, so let me go over that scores, what it means exactly. The first one is genre flag score. So that score shows how much the genres are evolving, uh, changing, from start till the end. I'll think this way, if a genre, if all genres are very constant from start till the end, that score will be lower. But if we have a variation over that, that score is increasing. So having that score high or low, it doesn't mean uh, anything qualitatively, but it helps to position. Uh, because every type of uh, film uh, genre that it has like a certain uh, certain rhythm of these chains. So you will see the score for the film and you will see also this average you see in the parentheses 
what's the average of that score for similar films to that content. So it's, it shows if it, that positioning is similar to similar content or, or, or that film is doing something different than, than, than similar contents. And the range bet is between zero and 10, as you can see. So, and the other two scores that are relevant to emotional reaction, uh, so our system is measuring the emotional, expected emotional response of the audience. Again, it measures this from start till the end of film. Normally, you would use focus groups to that, but thanks to AI, now we can do this automatically. Uh, and, and related to that, we have two scores. One of them is positive emotion score. Uh, the range for that is from minus 10 to 10. So if we have dominance of positive emotions, that, that score will become higher. If it's rather like a, a negative emotions are uh, dominant, uh, yeah, that will be lower or, or even minus. Like for example, like for a horror movie, that score will be uh, lower. And the other thing is emotional intensity. Emotional intensity, it really considers all the scenes. It shows like in total how much intensity of emotions the, the, the audience would have. Again, here uh, we wouldn't claim having this course higher, lower, or lower uh, is better. It's, it's rather important to look at that together with the averages because every genre has different type of positioning. So again, it helps to position the content. And lastly, we will, you will see also these uh, demographics predictions. And here again with the AI, by using screenplays, uh, it's predicting who is the target audience in terms of gender uh, and age groups. Uh, you will s see that with this coding, M or F uh, for the gender and then age interval on the slides. So yeah, I mean, that's, I, I mean you will have, of course, the, the analysis we do is not limited to, to that. We have much more things like uh, analysis for the box office, predictions, streaming, uh, more in-depth character analysis, but it will be impossible to put all those in three minutes format. But you have these uh, Largo AI connect codes on your chairs. Later, you can connect uh, to, to our platform uh, and see these projects in more detail. Just one note on that, uh, the codes are not active yet. So please keep the cards with you. It will be acti activated from tomorrow morning. So you can access to, to the projects from tomorrow morning to see all the details, all financial forecasts, uh, and all other predictions. And before just switching to Brevin, I want to also mention from our team, we are here, uh, Celine Udrio, Alex Koke, and Frederick Shabani. So yeah, let's thank to them as well. They had a great effort to bring this event together as well. Yeah, so let's continue with the pitches. Thank you very much. Okay, I am gonna read some tiny intros. I'm gonna be as quick as possible because it's, again, it's about you pitching your project. Our first project is Cupid Fest. Okay, this is Catherine Hollis Peters. She is a producer dedicated to empowering women filmmakers, and I also take note that she has a very strong list of acting credits, validating a lot of onset experience. Catherine is also a noted wellness guru. Catherine? <laughs> Thank you for that introduction. And thank you, Sammy, for doing this and Largo AI. It's, what, it's just a wonderful opportunity and I'm thrilled to be in the room with so many extraordinary filmmakers and industry professionals. I'm Katherine Hollis-Peters. I am an actor, a producer, and a writer. And I started my journey at a very young age in Atlanta, Georgia. I then left the industry to pursue two other careers. One is a fashion designer where I raised $30 million on Wall Street and then I pivoted into the wellness business, but I am thrilled to be back in the ma movie making business and spearheading our film, Cupid Fest, along with Maggie Egan Cummings, who is filming away, and Jennifer O'Hare, who are the creators of this beautiful project. Have you ever had that gut-wrenching, all-consuming feeling of being in love? Have you had that gut-wrenching, all-consuming feeling of being heartbroken? We've all been there. Now, our film, Cupid Fest, is a heartwarming destination comedy. This is a Jane Fonda's book club meets Leap Year. This is the story of two Irish-American sisters of a certain age, 
we like to call them queenagers, who have been bloodied on the battlefield of love, and they escape to Ireland for a matchmaking festival where they meet many Mr. Wrongs and one Mr. Right. Or is he? Now, on this journey, they come to find that it's never too late to fall in love because the heart doesn't know how old it is. Our film is rated PG-13, and it's the perfect film for a younger demographic, as well as this over 45 demographic that is hungry for an uplifting, feel-good movie like Cupid Fest. Our budget is $5 million, and we are shooting in Ireland, so we get a tax incentive 30% of a million dollars. We also have another million on the table. Now, Largo is projecting that Cupid Fest does 27 million between box office and streaming. Who is on our team? Well, our dream team includes Rita Wilson as the lead sister, Annie. And we pinned Timothy Murphy in the supporting role of James. Award-winning Irish director, John Carney, has our script in his hands. So why this film now? Well, we are thrilled to tell this uplifting story that the world needs today. And we want to give a voice to the large segment of the population who has been largely unrepresented and has great spending power. This over 50 demographic is a whopping 62 million in population with 3 point trillion in spending power. And that's gonna to grow to be 40 trillion, and that's trillion with the T, net worth by 2030. So when is the last time you saw a romantic comedy that swept you off your feet? It's time, and Cupid's Best is ready. Thank you for your time. Please join us after the presentations. We'd love to speak to you more and show you our full financial package. Katherine Hollis-Peters. That was perfect. That was absolutely perfect. And I know you prepared so much. Thank you for going first. I know it makes it a weird. I'll be over there. If, if you're really going too long, I'll try to wave you down. Um, next is Lost in Summer Night by Jonathan Smith. Jonathan Smith is an experienced theater and film actor who is coming uniquely from working in the tech industry and also predicted there would be multiple union strikes over a year ago. Um, I would like to acknowledge that he is producing this with From the Heart Productions because Carol Dean's impact on the indie filmmaker support is unmatched. I just want to give a shout out to Carol Dean. Thank you. Let me know when we're starting. All right, all right, go, all right. So hello everybody, my name is Jonathan Smith. I'm an actor, writer, and producer. I've been in the film industry for over 15 years. Uh, I just this year created my first micro-budget feature. It's already been picked up for distribution. And my next goal is to create this film, Lost in a Summer Night. The genre is crime drama slash neo-noir thriller. And the log line is, after secretly falling for one another, a broke college graduate and a abused housewife plot to murder her wealthy husband and take the insurance money, but struggle to maintain trust in each other long enough or long enough to carry out the plan. And I wrote this film with the Gen Z and millennial audience in mind, specifically with their struggle with student debt. And what makes this film unique is the main character Desmond goes through this. He's just a regular guy who did exactly what society told him to do. He went to USC, he graduated with honors, and, and he did this while still being in the foster care system as a teenager. But instead of a good career and family and prosperity. He just ended up in a recession, dealing with challenges with AI, going from side gig to side gig with no end in sight to pay off the debt. And on one of his side gigs, he meets Maya, a beautiful woman who's married to a wealthy real estate developer who's going through abuse and other challenges in the household as well. And then they come up with a plan. And that plan is to murder that wealthy husband take the insurance money, and if they can make it look like an accident, they become millionaires overnight. Now, my goal for this film is to not only create a thrilling noir experience that audiences will love, but um, to also show everyone the challenges that the younger generations are facing today with their finances and socially. And I plan to use classic influences like Double Indemnity and The Killing by Stanley Kubrick but also using modern influences like Drive and Parasite. Now, currently, uh, we're in the financing stages, the early financing stages of the project. 
Our research is showing it's best to start with a streaming partner in mind if possible, but if not, um, this film can definitely be done independently. Now, I'm confident that this film is going to be a success for a variety of reasons, but I'll list two today. Uh, one, Largo is showing a 20 times rate of return on this million dollar budget. Uh, I'm very confident in that. And number two, 60% of this film takes place in one location, making it doable on a million dollar budget with names attached. And I believe I have a little time left, so I'll leave with one quote. Did you know that the biggest asset to the U.S. government is not taxes? It's student loan debt. And with that said, my name is Jonathan. Thank you, Largo, for the opportunity. Working on my, working on my second dissertation, I am very, very aware of this. Um, so thank you for bringing that to light. Um, OK, next is Werewolf with Susan Darcy. She is impressively leading the charge at Brit Can Media. Get it, it's so exciting. She's worked with Martha Stewart and Steven Spielberg, as well as NBC, ABC, and Universal, and is a prolific on boards and on juries. Also, I just want to drop the mic with Power Rangers from screen to stage. <laughs> Hi, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, it's now. Um, I'm Susanna Darcy, president of Brickhand Media, and yes, I've had extensive experience in film, television, and live events. In fact, I've done a $30 million wedding in Egypt. And during COVID, I was part of the Wolf Pack because I got to work with Dick Wolf. And now I get to build my own Wolf Pack. So I'm happy to announce that um, we have acquired the worldwide distribution rights for Werewolf, um, created by Stan Lee, one of the most top grossing executive producers in the world. And we're very excited about it. Um, running it through AI, was, uh, through Largo, was an amazing experience. And I have to say, Largo AI has got great taste. Um, <laughs> uh, it was very interesting to look at these numbers, and when I saw the um, positive emotion numbers negative, I went, huh? But it's actually very good for this film. Um, it's also um, saying that it's going to make opening weekend about, I think it was like 25 million, up to 140 million. And one of the things that um, Werewolf, created by Stanley, really has is it's a darker side of Stanley. This is a thriller. This is heroic, it's got some crime in it, it's got a little bit of humor, but it's really the mad scientist, and the mad scientist is able to turn into a werewolf, and there's another werewolf that comes into play. So we feel that we owe the fans an ode to Stan Lee, and we're very excited about it. We've budgeted at 20 million, we're looking for a $5 million equity investor, and we have attracted Alex Proyas on board as executive producer as well as he's going to be doing our special effects in Australia through Heretic Foundation, which we're very excited about. They've actually started the, um, the wire framing. Um, I do think that as of this week, we might have found 2.5 million, so the number's lower, and we are giving direct share. So we really want some great partners. There's a lot of opportunity here. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to expand, and we're very excited about this. So please come see me. Thank you. See, that's, that is what ASM is for. You're finding your money right now. You're making it happen. So next is Celestials. Celestials is Jennifer Long Longay is a technical wizard having worked on major animation franchises such as Sing, The Secret Life of Pets, as well as The Grinch. And this technical savvy makes me think this might be why this is one of the largest projects that is being pitched in this. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Jennifer Longe, and I'm the writer and producer of Celestials. I studied computer animation at Les Gobelins, which is one of the top animation schools in the world. And as she mentioned, I, afterward, I joined uh, Illumination Studios Paris, where I worked on notable projects such as Despicable Me 3. While there, I also contributed to the writing of one of the short movies around the Grinch. Inspired by a little known fairy tale called The Barred Moon, Celestial is a high budget, family friendly animated film. Uh, a week ago, its screenplay was, uh, was actually uh, became a quarter finalist in the short script feature uh, screenplay competition. The movie solos a young scientist who helps a woman uh, who claims to be the moon find a friend who is a fallen star. But unknown to them, a mysterious figure schemes to prevent her from returning to her realm so that both, so that both roles can go into, into darkness. 
I discovered the Baryan Mood on a, on a website called Listverse, where it was actually ranked six, uh, sixth fairy tale that deserved an animation adaptation. After reading the fairy tale, I find it to be very compelling and actually wrote the first draft during COVID. I actually managed to finish it uh, right before production on Sync 2 resumed, so you might say that the stars aligned. <laughs> I am creating my own animation studio, Realme Quest, to handle the CG productions, and I have experts in the animation industry and top filmmakers that have shown interest in it. For those keen on understanding uh, our financial planning in details, a comprehensive budget breakdown is available on the Largo platform. While the Baron Moon is not as universally known as other fairy tale, it has its own dedicated audience. Given the current trend of rediscovering and reimagining this rich story, it is the perfect time to introduce this tale to a wider audience. From our uh, Celestial's emotional intensity score is seven, its projected gross revenue to budget ratio is 355%, and Levi Miller and Ashley Butcher were suggested as the most suitable voice actors. An animated mock-up trailer was completed a few, month, a few months ago. I look forward to sharing it with you and to further discuss the fascinating journey of the moon and the stars. Thank you very much. <laughs> You all are doing amazing. Your projects are incredible. So not only will you be able to see all of the cast and the emotional, remember that when you go onto the app, when you go onto the QR code in the app tomorrow, you'll also be able to look at the financials. So that'll help you get even more holistic um, information on what is happening. Next is Chasing Mary. But Daryl Tucker is here. He has a lot of educational and experiential credits and is devoted to building an opportunity creating engine in entertainment with his company, Lost Lake Productions. Thank you. Before I begin, I haven't been to LA in a few years, and after a few days, it feels like a mix of Imperial Rome and Mad Max. <clears throat> Good afternoon, my name is Daryl Tucker. I represent Lost Lake Productions, LLC. I first wish to express my sincere gratitude to the team of Largo AI for not only this amazing opportunity to pitch on the Malibu stage at the AFM, but also earlier this year at the Cannes Film Festival. Lost Lake Productions is an alliance of independent filmmakers who are passionate about the art and science of cinema. Our mission statement is simple, to form a new kind of production company founded by filmmakers to craft visionary cinema that inspires. The dramatic feature film we are pitching to you today is entitled Chasing Mary. Screenwriter Jack Teague, who is here in the audience, has spent a decade exhaustively researching and adapting Mary Welsh Hemingway's autobiography, How It Was, into a powerful story of redemption and perseverance. Ernest Hemingway once said, every man's life ends the same way. It is only the details of how we lived and how we died that distinguishes one man from another. Prophetic words. Although Ernest's life ended in tragedy, our film Chasing Mary is about his last wife's journey, which ended in triumph. Fade Up, Montana, 1961. A rented two-door hardtop Buick rolls out of Livingston, westbound on US Highway 90. The occupants, Mary Walsh Hemingway, husband, Ernest, and family friend George Brown begin the last road trip back to Ketchum, Idaho from the Mayo Clinic. Mary leans forward from the back seat to sing softly in Ernest's ear, hoping to penetrate the gloom of his mental illness. Cut to London, 1941. Mary Walsh Hemingway is a renowned war correspondent for both Time and Look magazines. Little did she know that her life was about to change when author Ernest Hemingway proposes matrimony before they were both free from their previous marriages. Cut to Yale University, 2001. Mary Wells is researching her PhD dissertation on strong females in media when she stumbles upon an autobiography that was about to change her life, how it was. Fade out, Washington, D.C., 1962. Mary Welsh Hemingway walking hand in hand with JFK at the White House to accept the Medal of Freedom after Ernest's suicide. The beauty of working with Largo AI is that they have powerful analytical tools that have allowed us to show that for a preliminary $5 million production budget, the return on investment on this film would be a net $18 million. In my 30 years experience as an indie filmmaker, I've shepherded several projects from conception through production to successful distribution contracts. My title, The Theater Bazaar, was a critical hit and official festival selection at Citrus in Spain, Fright Fest in London, opened the Fantasia Festival in Montreal, and we had our US premiere at the Lincoln Center in New York City. We are looking for partners with vision. We are currently in talks with several companies such as Bondit Media and Buffalo 8 on possible casting selection, 
pre-sales and distribution for a pitch deck and full teaser trailer on both Chasing Mary and our slate of other projects, please look at our website, Lost Lake Productions. Thank you very much. These are all so amazing. Um, these are all so amazing, seriously. Uh, but not for me is the next project. This is Daryl Simmons. And that would have been your timer, uh, Daryl. Uh, Darren, Darren is a producer, talent manager, digital strategist, entrepreneur, and past president of the Talent Managers Association, where she worked with Sharon Stone, Joan Rivers, Betty White, and William Shatner. She also worked with Paramount Studios, Sony, and Fox, and is a member of various art orgs. I also really liked your film, Locating Silver Lake. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you to AFI, and thank you to Largo, to Sammy, and the whole team. You guys are amazing. My name is Darren Simons, and she just read my whole intro so I can go through my first 20 cards. Um, I, I do have a company. I do lit management, and I do um, regular talent management, and then we produce, and we're actually moving into the gaming space. But what I'm here today is to talk about, but not, but not for me. Um, it's based on my producing partner's life. Uh, and I'm really happy to say he survived uh, the story. Um, we're here to talk about something, to talk about mental health and to talk about um, substance abuse. And I know that we've, it touches every single person here. So I want you to think about you and your own life and how you deal with it. It's not a fun thing to talk about, but through this story, we build a compelling arc to show you how it's possible to survive even the worst circumstances. Um, so our genre uh, flux score, I want to make sure I got that um, correct, uh, designates this as a romance drama. So I'm really glad that that compounded the fact that we felt the same way. So thank you, AI. Uh, every person who has attached themselves to But Not For Me has also um, really, truly resonated with this story. Uh, and attach themselves. We've been very fortunate on the high level of talent that we already have behind um, the scenes because Rosemary Christman lives a perfect life, but she wants to scream. She has a doting husband and two beautiful children, and yet the idyllic 1950s suburbia cannot be drowned out uh, by enough pills and alcohol. Rosemary's husband, Wally, decides to build her, her Barbie dream house. What happens is the general contractor that shows up on site is her first love of her life, who her mother forbade her from marrying. We set this up as agonizing choices. Does Rosemary abandon her perfect life to save her soul? It's extremely com complicated, and she's only human. But not for me is um, lessons in Chemistry. If you haven't seen it yet on uh, Apple TV, please run, don't walk. It's amazing. And Revolutionary Road. Our budget is, um, we have uh, the budget at $8.25 million. Um, we are looking for $1 million to start so that we can go out and make hard offers to talent and then the rest will fill in with sales and financing. Paul Barbeau is our line producer, and I mention him because he told us that there is 60% out of Canada, which we didn't believe, but there is. So 60% tax incentives with an additional 5%. Um, we have Leah Thompson of Back to the Future fame as our director. I've worked with her for the past few years to develop, and she has hung tight with us and then really worked with our screenwriter. Um, our screenwriter uh, is um, incredible, apologies. <laughs> so our, our screenwriter is currently CAA and WGA, and he is working on um, a film right now uh, that he's writing, which was a number one uh, Mitch Albom's bestseller, uh, A Stranger in a Boat. Um, and then his name is Quentin Peoples, and he's amazing. We also partnered with Rearview Pictures. Tobias Waymar is a big, he's been involved in, in sales forever, and he's now switched to his company. Annie Mahoney is a brilliant line producer herself. Eric Martin is the writer of Loki and Holly Cook. They're all behind on the production side. And once the SAG strike is resolved, praise God, um, which it's happening now. They are sitting at the Cheesecake Factory at the Galleria. Um, <laughs> like, 
come on, um, before January. Our director, Leah, it, will be able to go out and make the calls for us and work with our talent. Now, last but not least, I just want to tell you, we, we love Margaret Qualley as our lead, Andy McDowell to play her mom, because she is her mom, Joseph Gordon-Levitt to play the dutiful husband, Patrick Schwarzenegger, because He's really easy on the eyes. Um, our positive emotion score goes from a negative three to a six. And uh, I just want to thank you guys for everything today. And I really appreciate your time. Thank you. I'll, I'll speak even faster. Next is Isabel's Garden. Kit Rich is a writer extraordinaire who is here with her debut feature film that has been completed, Principal Photography, uh, which intends to provide hope in a polarized world. <laughs> Amazing, amazing. She is championing real people stories with a, with a working history, keeping top fit talent, including Jennifer Lawrence. Oh. Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Kit Rich, and I am a partner at Iris Tuesday Productions. Thank you so much for being here and supporting us. Incredible projects. I'm so proud of all of you. Um, so for the past 15 years, I have been really well known in a completely different industry. <laughs> I'm a celebrity fitness trainer and fitness entrepreneur. I've trained, actually one of my clients was just mentioned. I have trained some of the top A-list celebrities in the world for movie roles. And my online videos and fitness content garners hundreds of thousands to millions of views still to this day. But, you know, I actually just heard some, you're not, you're, you're not worried I'm gonna make you do a squat, are you? <laughs> I just heard a little back talk there, don't worry. Uh, f but on my off hours, on my own time, I was pursuing my greatest passion. I became a published essayist, a playwright, and Isabel's Garden, which I wrote, directed, and produced, is my feature debut. Isabel's Garden is actually a fully completed project. It is fully funded at $650,000, and I'm currently seeking meetings with sales agents and distributors. Isabel's Garden is a hopeful family drama. It stars Karen David, who you would recognize from Fear the Walking Dead, Once Upon a Time, and the very popular CBS movie, When Christmas Was Young. It's about an ambitious small town TV reporter whose life becomes upended when she tragically loses her husband and she's tasked with having to help raise her 15-year-old stepdaughter alongside his ex-wife. Largo's analysis shows that the top movie comparables are The Descendants, The Help, and The Perks of Being a Wallflower. It also, I'm sure you can see, I'm sure it's up there, that it gets an eight out of 10 in emotional intensity. And I don't know about you and family, but that sounds about right, <laughs> right? And what that means for me too is that's directly connected to connection, feeling, and getting someone's attention. It's female-led, it's multicultural, it's in both Spanish and English, and it's multi-generational. Thematically, it's timeless, but the truth is it's actually very current because it's about blended family. It's about dealing with trauma and grief. It's about the power of choice and finding home in chosen family. As you can see, this movie, actually, I don't know if you can see, you can't. It was made for well under a million. <laughs> but Largo's analysis shows that for streaming, in its peak uh, membership, peak month membership, it will reach, it will get 4.4 million views, and that's just domestic. In today's world where everything is so polarized and parents have to turn off the TV before their kids or their teenagers walk into the room because of violent content, Isabel's Garden is so unique in the sense that it doesn't shy away from those hard truths about life, but allows families to come together and watch together and to heal. And while this might be my first time getting up in front of an audience not asking you to get your heart rate up, <laughs> I am offering you a gem of a movie that does go straight to the heart. It has always been my job, no matter where I'm standing, to inspire and to instill hope. And I know, I know I've done that with Isabel's Garden. Thank you so much for your time. I look forward to meeting you. So exciting. I want success for you all. I want you to get funded. I want you to get distribution. This is so exciting. Um, Sean Scott Griffin has the project Red Rail here. He is coming here with a ton of big budget production experience and also founded his company inspired by top models of production and leaders of artists support, including his late mother who's passed, who, has a so who was a social justice warrior. Um, his work is advocating for established and emerging filmmakers, especially those who represent the majority world. Thank you.
Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Largo, for hosting me. Um, my name is Sean Scott Griffin, and I am a producer, script analyst, and writer from London, England. Um, I set up this, uh, my company this year called Rebel Year, and we specialise in making high-quality, entertaining, socially conscious films for the international audience. One such film is the film that I'm going to talk to you today about. It's Red Rail. Red Rail is a contained time travel horror mystery set almost entirely on a British rail train in the 1980s and 1960s. We're looking for up to $2.1 million in production finance, less than any UK soft money, so about 20%. And we also need a cracking good sales agent to help us sell this film around the world in places like this next year or the year after when we make it. Um, so here's the log line, because I know that's what you really want to hear. <laughs> On a late night train in the 1980s, a young thief steals, a, a young thief pickpockets a strange red gem from a sinister man only to discover to her horror that the strange red gem can transport her mind back 20 years to the 1960s where she must solve a spate of grisly serial killings in order to stop a terrible cosmic horror from taking over the world. You weren't expecting that, were you? No, you weren't. I knew it. I fucking knew it. <laughs> so I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. There have been so many horror movies and there have been so many time travel movies. In fact, Netflix and Amazon have a comparable of their own on their platforms at the moment, Time Cut and Totally Killer. So how is Red Rail different? Well, unlike those films, Red Rail aims to genuinely terrify the shit out of our audience <laughs> through like good old-fashioned, visceral, evocative filmmaking, blood, guts, gore, some bloody slaughtering, <laughs> wicked, awesome British iconography, and just a little bit of fucking swearing because it's a British film. Yeah. Right? And we like to swear. We want someone like Ella Ray Smith in the lead role. We're speaking to her agent now. She's someone who's going to blow up in the next five years. I think the next um, Florence Taylor Joy or, um, uh, sorry, Florence Pugh or Anya Taylor Joy. Don't even know my British act actresses. Um, and to start opposite, we'd love someone like uh, a type like Helena Bonham Carter or Gillian Anderson, someone who's going to really sell this film at these markets next year or the year after. Um, so I've just got a few seconds left just to remind you, we need $2 million in production finance, less than any soft money. My name is Sean, the film is called Red Rail, and if you like what you see and you want to know more about this fucking wicked project, please come and see me afterwards. I am the guy in the blood red t-shirt. Thank you. <laughs> That was awesome. All right, next is Maggie Avila with the project Deep Echo. Maggie has more than two decades of premiere acting credits and whose career crea creative career was founded in opera performance. She is now an award-winning producer-director whose feature, first feature documentary is currently distributed by Gravitas. She also works as a coach with working actors and you guys are doing incredible. Keep going, keep going. Thank you, everyone. It's such an honor to be here with all of you. What an amazing, amazing group of filmmakers and great projects. Um, I am also privileged to be here with Largo AI and to have your attention, so thank you very much. Deep Echo is a futuristic sci-fi drama about a fearless scientist who investigates a mysterious pyramid hidden in the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean but she gets trapped in her flooded artificial intelligence capsule. While trying to survive, she makes the greatest of human discoveries. Deep Echo's comparable films are The Abyss, Interstellar, Everything Everywhere, All at Once, and Gravity. Target audience, as you can see, probably in there already, yes, um, 13 to 55. It is proposed to be directed by Mr. John Tottletub, and to start Mr. Nicholas Cage, Donnie Jan, and Shah Rukh Khan. <laughs> We're getting there. And um, also, let me see. My legs are shaking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Um, it is set to start production in June of 2024 and um, with a gross box office projections of $100 million and worldwide over $300 million as per Largo AI analysis. Yes, God, just came in the perfect timing, Largo, thank you. Um, also, um, we, um, 
Yes. Well, there is a huge difference between Deep Echoes and its comparable film's budget. The similarities that have proven to captivate the audiences are masterfully integrated in this script, making it artistically and technically possible to execute. We intend to capitalize on all distribution channels and to obviously uh, showcase in the most prestigious film festival awards. We are also in collaboration with elite partners hosting biannual events, such galas, sustainable fashion shows, promoting the UN sustainable goals, especially those of which Deep Echo is promoting. Um, also, so if you want to learn more about our financing strategy, please visit deepechomovie.com to set up a meeting with us. And um, also in there, you may donate through our fiscal sponsors, Creative Visions. So grateful. And remember that Deep Echo is more than a thrilling, super fantastic, wondrous film. It's a voyage to a better future. Thank you very much. At this, it's, this is sort of, sort of a halfway point. I just want to say thank you again to Largo for being a part of the future when it comes to predictive analysis that supports both creators and investors so that more amazing work can be made with more informed decisions. The next project is I Am Here by Kim Dang. Kim Dang is joining us with tons of production experience and credits supporting at all levels and sizes of productions. And two of her recently produced shorts, because your bio was too short, I had to go look stuff up. I watched um, Flirting with Possibilities and Esther in Wonderland, and they both showcase how she is producing work with meaningful human-centered stories and strong production value. Thank you so much for the intro, and thank you so much uh, for being here, and uh, Largo AI for inviting me uh, to present our movie, I Am Here. Um, I am Kim Dang. I'm actually from Switzerland, like Largo AI, but I'm currently based in New York City. Um, I used to be an applied math professor at Yale University, but currently I'm an actress and producer of I'm Here. Um, so our movie is an adventure and action drama. Um, our action star uh, lead is Mike Coulter, who plays in a role of Marcus, who finds himself um, on a strenuous and difficult hike in the Swiss Alps with his daughter, Jessie. Now, neither of them want to be on that hike because they have quite a lot of personal issues with each other. Um, Jessie's mother just passed away, so Marcus has to step up in a father world that he has abandoned for quite some time. Whereas Jessie, on the other hand, she is not only a resentful and stubborn teenager, but also highly capable. Um, and on top of that, she used to be Marcus's son. Now, this movie has a lot of moments of action and adventure and funny moments, but it's foremost a movie about a parent and a child who try to reconnect in a situation where none of them um, fulfill each other's expectations, neither in a way they act, the, the way they behave, the way they talk. Um, so how can you find the connection in that moment, in that situation, with true love, unconditional love, warmth, openness, and acceptance? Um, the story is loosely based on Miss Peppermint's life. She's a drag queen TV personality currently seen in Netflix show Survival of the Thickest. We also have uh, the honor of having Billy Porter's team on board as executive producers. Uh, Billy Porter is an actor, singer known from Pose. And I'm producing this movie with Mike Coulter, who is widely known as Marvel's Luke Cage, or from the action movie with Jared Butler, Plane. Um, we're looking to film this movie in Switzerland and our budget, total budget is four and a half million. We are applying for two million in uh, public Swiss film fund, which is soft money. Um, and I'm here today because we're looking for partners who like to uh, come on board with us um, to chip in two and a half million private equity. Um, I'm so grateful 
that we have the opportunity to talk more after this presentation. Come find me, and I'll tell you more about that. In the meantime, my warmest thank you uh, for your attention. <laughs> There's so much science in this room, it's amazing. Um, okay, so the next project uh, is Lipstick Palm. David Tyler Pearson is coming up. He's a local LA producer from Atlanta and an IATSE Local 800 member whose experience working with teams to empower creatives is at the forefront of his company. And my personal admiration is coming from Treehouse Masters because I want to live in one. <laughs> Hello, oh, a little taller. Uh, hello there. Uh, I'm Tyler Pearson from Filmmaker and Plot Point. We are a partner sales and production company. Today I am thrilled to present you our dark comedy, Lipstick Palm. It is written by Sarah Apple and the Julia Fox, social media icon and fashionista, who is known for her breakout role in Uncut Gems and most recently her New York Times bestselling novel, Down the Drain. Uh, at first glance, Lipstick Palm appears to be a tale of a struggling actress in a superficial world of Hollywood, one we're all too familiar with. Surrounded by insincere flatterers and manipulative opportunists, our story, many of us, uh, but when you delve a little bit deeper, you'll uncover a dark roller coaster ride that explores the depths of ambition and the ruthless dynamics of power and beauty. In this unforgiving world, there are no boundaries to what one will do to achieve their dreams. The story revolves around Lauren, an actress whose career is stuck in neutral. She finds herself pigeonholed into roles like pretending to be a model, LARPing as a recovering addict for her AA sponsor, and catering to the demands of her toxic producer boyfriend, Todd Powers. We all hate Todd. Uh, when she wakes up one fateful morning to discover Todd dead, she makes a decision that sets our dark comedic journey in motion. Over the course of the next 36 hours, fueled by adrenaline, ketamine, and a peculiar addiction to $18 Erewhon smoothies, Lauren and her friends embark on a wild ride filled with drug-fueled antics, attempted manslaughter, and an A-list of an A-list celebrity, escapes from lurking ex-lovers, and a descent into delusion that seems impossible to escape. Julia Fox and Sarah Apple's brilliant script features rich, complex, and utterly unforgettable characters, guided by our director Eva Michonne, hailing from Canada. This is a woman-centric story that focuses in on the demands of, and expectations of women in Hollywood, walking the tightrope between ambition and insanity. Our film has the ruthlessness of Jawbreaker, the intensity of Good Time, and the absurdity of Weekend at Bernie's. We have SAG and RIM agreements agreed upon. We're currently working with our casting directors, uh, Deanna Brigady and Andrea Bunker who you may know from casting Interstellar, Big Little Lies, Jurassic World, and The Wilds. We plan to shoot in Q1 of 2024. We have around 1.2 million raised, around a f of, of our overall budget, 5 million. Uh, we are open to equity investment and foreign pre-sales. We're happy to continue conversations over the next few weeks as we lock in our cast, and we hope we can talk with some of you later. Thanks for the opportunity, AFM and Largo. <laughs> Raymond Carago and Anjan Prasada, both very impressive, but could not be here. Stepping in to rep is Dustin Ardeen, whose life as an actor and stuntman includes stage and screen and major productions, as well as producing credits, and he is a professionally trained wrestler who has worked all over the world. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you to Largo. Thank you to AFM. I'm very, very happy and excited to be here to uh, tell you about our project, Black Liberty, I see so many wonderful projects, and a side note, if any of you out there need an actor, right here. Um, <laughs> um, we all know the, uh, I just got back from Oxford University where I'm getting my doctorate in film and media studies, so we wanted to bring a, sig a historically significant tale to life, a new one, one that we haven't seen before. We all know that uh, historical figures have a great place in cinematic uh, history. Some examples of that are William Wallace in Mel Gibson's Braveheart, even up to the current uh, The Killing of the Flower Moon with uh, Robert De Niro and Leonardo DiCaprio. Our story is a 10 episode um, series uh, that tells the tale of Troussant L'Overture, who was a um, Haitian born slave who not only gained his freedom, but also helped uh, lead his people against Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte 
um, who Napoleon has his own rich history in the cinematic world. Uh, we're about to see a new epi um, uh, episodic or bio biopic um, from Ridley Scott, and uh, that's going to be great. But as we all know, it's any great story, there's always two sides, and it's high time we see the other side of some of these stories to give new cultural diversity and new heroes bring them uh, to life. Uh, uh, Toussaint was uh, born a slave, got his freedom, and helped lead a rebellion against Napoleon and uh, gain independence for the entire, uh, you know, for, for Haiti. And <clears throat> when you look at something that has these kind of cultural diversities and their new stories that people want to hear, they bring about all this new diversity to the already existing wonderful light of historical figures in uh, film and television. Um, we think that it's high time to see new heroes, to see new uh, stories, to bring to light, to entertain new generations. And um, we are very excited about this project right now. It is in the developmental stage. We have the full pitch deck, the full, uh, the full TV show Bible, uh, which I'd be happy to show with any of you right after this. And uh, we think that it is time for a new, new story, a new hero to be told. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Um, next, Melissa McGinnis is bringing us the last comments. Melissa McGinnis is a producer with a background in front of the camera and as a union actor. Her transferable and valuable skills, because that's my research, is here includes corporate compliance and financial reporting. She is the CEO of Smart Angels F Film Fund, which includes Oscar winning team members. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad to be here and happy to see some familiar faces in the audience as well. So my name is Melissa McGinnis. I am CEO of Smart Angels Film Fund. I have an incredible team assembling behind this picture. We just brought on Randy Churro, who is our financial producer, who is a member of the PGA and the DGA. And we have other members who are coming on board that have been on Oscar winning teams or as big pictures such as Midway, which would be Robert Scratch Mitchell, who was a second unit director for the aerial stunts in Midway. Uh, this feature film is based on a true story. Only one plane flew this dangerous humanitarian mission. It's titled The Last Comets, and its budget is 25 million. Sometimes the depths of love are found at the height of tragedy. It's been 20 years since this Royal Canadian Air Force pilot risked his life and his career for a beautiful American doctor he fell in love with while on a mission in Rwanda. He still carries the prescription with her doctor's orders on it. It says, number one, get you and your crew home safe. Number two, shave off that ugly mustache. But it's order number three that still haunts him. It's a flashback to Kigali, Rwanda, 1994, during the Civil War and the genocide. Jack organizes a rescue mission to save gravely wounded children left to die in a church far from the safety of the makeshift base. The MSF clinic and the C-130 plane are under heavy fire as it's flown in. Gramps sees Jack for the first time and is stunned how her beauty transcends the horror of the war they are experiencing. She is calm under pressure as she works diligently to stitch up and save as many children as she can. Orders come to evacuate the base and leave all the locals behind. Jack refuses to leave without the children and she convinces Gramps to fly back and get them against orders. They barely make it out alive under heavy fire. Now in the safety of Kenya, they have a chance to unwind and their love grows. However, Gramps realizes that he loves her enough to let her go. As they part, she gives him a passionate kiss and slips the prescription in his pocket. Present day, Gramps' best friend and co-pilot convinces him to finally complete number three of the doctor's orders. This film compares to Top Gun with its aerial action and also on, our, um, on a lot of our dramatic effects within the film. Um, it also uh, compares with Blood Diamond because it's set in the similar dangers and it has an epic love story like The Notebook. It has a wide audience appeal from age 17 and up with our biggest audience of course being the males 18 to 30. And, uh, 
Margot Roby for Jack has a high score of 87%. Smart Angels has contributed 125K. The script is production ready and was polished by Kathleen McLaughlin, who was the ghostwriter for Salt and does all of Philip Noyce's scripts. We are seeking $1 million to attach the talent and secure the bond, and we are looking for our distribution partners. Thank you. I'm Melissa McGinnis with the last comments. Uh, come join us on our mission. How is everyone doing? How is everyone doing? Like a little, little, okay. We're doing okay? This, this is a lot. This is a lot to take in. This is a lot to process. There's a lot of emotional intensity happening here. Um, okay, next is Exile. Donovan DeBoer and Keith Shaw. Donovan DeBoer is an award-winning producer and visual effects artist, an accomplished writer and creative director, including major multi-million dollar entertainment and studio productions around the world. Keith Shaw has also 30 years of experience as a director, producer, and AD in both unscripted, scripted, TV, film, HBO, ABC, CBS, NBC, PBS, Amazon, Fox, and more. <laughs> She already said it all. Uh, she said everything about it. <laughs> but uh, we're light chaser pictures. Yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Donovan. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Light Chaser Pictures and also the one of the one of the two producers of Exile. Yes. Um, I've been working in in this industry for probably about the last 17 years, primarily in film marketing, uh, packaging, directing, VFX, and producing. Um, my last film. Outlaw Johnny Black actually was just released in theaters this past September. Very proud of that. And, uh, you know, I want to thank Largo, Largo and AI and AFM for having us here today. And uh, right. here we go. And I worked on Outlaw Johnny Black with uh, Donovan here. So uh, we decided to um, partner up together and put together a slate of films and um, television projects and um, mm -hmm. try to see what we can do. Right? All right. Exile. Here we go. Exile is Mad Max on an island. All right, so I want you to imagine a near future United States where an authoritarian regime gives rise to a second civil war. And the justice system is controlled by a dangerous AI trained in a biased data set. Yes, I know that's hard to imagine. Uh, their solution to crime is exile. It's an uncharted island prison where citizens sentenced by this AI face a deadly game of survival. Declan, who is a highly decorated Navy SEAL, is ordered by the president to lead a clean and sweep mission following the detonation of a bomb on the island. The big conflict is his brother's imprisoned there. He refuses a direct order. He's charged with treason and sentenced to exile with only 24 hours to stop the bomb and save his family. So while there, he joins forces with a group of tough ex-military and our heroine, Hollis, who's a freedom fighter that has infiltrated the island to liberate the innocent. There they face off against Exile's ruthless leader and his army of island warriors who stand in the way of their escape. With every move monitored by the president and her AI, Exile spirals into a series of intense battles and a fight for their lives as the clock ticks down. The stakes are high, the action is nonstop, and every second counts. Exile isn't just a tale of escape, it's a mirror of our world a reflection of the dangers of unchecked power and the lengths one will go to for family, freedom, and justice. So the budget right now, we have, it's actually 32 million, 40-day um, shooting schedule. And uh, we'll be shooting on sound stages here in Los Angeles. And right now, we're looking for locations uh, for an island. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we can uh, use any help we can get. We want to take advantage of uh, tax incentives and production resources. Um, We've identified A-list talent for our key roles, and we're integrating uh, the latest visual effects and virtual productions um, through our post partnerships with NEP Sweetwater, Halon Entertainment, and also Lux Machina. We've uh, connected with those three companies. Uh, we secured lenders for tax incentives and debt financing, and we're currently seeking $16 million for equity financing. And pre-sales. And pre-sales, that's correct. <laughs> So Exile is a globally commercial film in the sci-fi action genre. It hits all the marks for box office success. The theme of unchecked artificial intelligence and especially bias in technology is a highly relevant subject right now, and it's going to be well into the future. Um, our Largo Allen analysis was really positive. We got, I think, $165 million 
uh, across box office streaming and all of that. So that was really good. And we're inviting investors and sales rep distributors to participate in the IP. So thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Forgive me. Forgive me. This is going to take. This is going to take a minute. This is going to take one second. So. The next project is the American Can. Auditorio McKinday and John Keller are going to come up, but please just give me one second because the blacklist said this script is, quote, one of the best, quite possibly the most underrated bio that was submitted for me to share with you. Auditorio is especially trailblazing as a writer, director, producer whose work found it, has found it in her Nigerian American heritage from academic excellence awards from sitting President Reagan to uh, being repeated Sundance alumni. She's an advocate for societal transformational art. She has worked in the business level at the stu in studios. She has sat on panels around the world, noted by IMDb as a producer to watch. She is bridging cultures through storytelling, leading impact initiatives on major productions, and she's also the program director of the USC School of Cinematic Arts. You, Furu Flowers wrote your bio, and I have to say, she makes me a better human, so you have to have this space. And also, John Keller, your story needs to be told because you are a hero, so thank you, friend, for being here. You know, okay, don't start my three minutes yet because I didn't expect that, that bio. I didn't write that bio. I mean, it is part of my life, yes, but... I'm like, whoa, okay, yeah, that's me, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm Adetor McKinde, I'm writer, director, producer, and everything she basically said I do, I, I am, I am. Um, so thank you all for this opportunity to, to share this project with you. Um, you know, as a filmmaker, I'm often drawn to stories that define identity. Um, and after premiere my second short film at the Sundance Film Festival, I knew that my feature directorial debut would have to be one of great impact. So be careful what you ask for, because eight months later, Hurricane Katrina. Now, I know those two words bring up a lot of thoughts for everyone here in this room, but none more so than for this man standing next to me, John Keller, because the American can is his story. While profiled on media outlets like the American Heroes Channel and National Geographics, my action thriller drama is American Sniper meets the impossible meets I am legend. So Keller, is very much a reluctant hero. A former recon marine, tough and sturdy, a dark sense of humor, and a scant view of the world, barely getting by with tortured memories of Iraq. He is somewhat lost, misunderstood by his family, abandoned by his government, and just wants to be left alone with his tiny dog and the love of his precocious seven-year-old daughter. But then a storm comes and the levee breaches, and 80% of New Orleans is underwater. Outsiders, neighbors come seeking refuge in his low-rise complex, the American Can Apartments, but it's made clear that they are not wanted. With each passing day, helicopters fly over, all of them on the roof, with no relief in sight. The elderly left inside, alone and helpless, grow weak. The restless few begin to stir dangerously. No water, no food, 100 degrees of heat. The clock is ticking. And Keller, seeing the chaos engulfing the city slowly seep into the can, does just enough to not engage because his insanity is just way too high a price to pay. But once a Marine, always a Marine. Right, Kel? Yeah. <laughs> and so now it's a race against time. For Keller, it's a new war out of his control, but one he was, a mission he was destined to take as he risked his life for the rescue and safety of over 200 people. The American can disrupt the lens of what a hero looks like and cinematically engages on themes of trauma and courage, redemption and faith, and most importantly, humanity. And in the wave of this unstoppable protest and global empathy, quite frankly, the time to make this movie is right now. And for 17 years, 17 years, I have shepherded the vision to get his story to the screen. Armed with a blacklist endorsed screenplay, my producing partner, Per Melita, visual effects collaborat collaborators like Industrial Light and Magic and South Africa's Inspired Minority, as well as professional mentors and allies, Angelina Jolie and Malcolm D. Lee, Today, I am seeking distributors, financiers, above and below the line talent who are courageous and who believe in my vision 
and also believe that an ROI is not just going to be a return on investment, but a return on impact. Thank you. And I, I really appreciate Ms. McKinney taking the time out to try to put this story forth. I just want to get, get out of being stuck in Iraq and Katrina. So let's get this movie made so I can go and go on with my life. It's, this is just too much. Come on, this is too much, people. We're just right, get the money right over there right now. It's too much for, for all of you, but it's really, it's, you are doing, I believe in creators, I believe in the storytelling, I believe in the filmmakers, you are all doing extraordinary work and I want you to keep doing that work. Colette Smart is gonna come up next for Holy Town, Hollytown. Um, Australian born Colette Smart is a second gen industry professional who studied music, film, TV and medicine. Her company Soul Element Films is producing projects ranging from novels to films to commercial content. Colette is passionate about being a positive role model and she was also in a band in New Zealand and works in collaboration with many production companies in the Pacific Northwest. Ooh, well, that was a tough act to follow. <laughs> I was like, compose yourself, compose yourself. <laughs> Hi, I'm Colette Smart, and I am the CEO and a producer with Soul Element Films. And I'm here in association with From the Heart Productions. It's a 501c3 company uh, with Carol Dean and Carol Joyce. And we are embarking on a journey with Hollytown. Hollytown is a sci-fi alien family Christmas movie. <laughs> Yeah, right? <laughs> it is E.T. meets Home Alone. <laughs> it's about two young sibling aliens uh, that suffer the loss of their mother and decide to steal a ship, probably not a good idea, and travel to a planet far, far away, cold Earth, which they've never been to before. And they land in a place called Hollytown. Now, at Christmas time, Hollytown is like Whoville. You have never seen anything like it. And in the mall, we have the classic Santa. But yet, he's the real Santa Claus. So they arrive in this town, and they transform into human beings. And they meet these wonderful kids, Billy and Beth, and their friend Noah. And these kids decide to take them home and introduce them to their parents, Nicole and Peter. And they just tell their parents, hey, they're foreign exchange students. We need to keep them for a while. So then we find out that Nicole has an untreatable diagnosis, um, heart disease, that she is dying from. And all the children want for Christmas is for their mother to live. Now the aliens have a power source uh, that they can use to get home with, um, so they're left with a Sophie's choice. They can either save the mother, or they can go home and save themselves, because they've only got a certain amount of time to live in this atmosphere. So what do you think they're gonna choose? Well, like every alien movie out there that we've seen, they're definitely gonna choose to save the mother, right? So when they do that, that means that they've exhausted their resources to go home. But we have the real Santa Claus in town, so he pulls off a Christmas miracle and decides to tow them on the back of the <laughs> reindeer sleigh. And our closing credits are, we see Santa go over the moon towing their ship out into orbit. <laughs> so we have strategically created our cast um, with Largo's AI in mind. They gave us a beautiful, beautiful rundown of uh, what our percentages were with our actor choices, and that led us to our marketing strategy. And everybody that we picked was key to the character reference and to the points that we saw that match with Lagos. So we knew we were on the right track when we picked Emma Roberts to play Freva. We haven't attached any actors yet. Strike's still pending. Um, but we do know her and we started conversations um, and she's all excited about the idea. We are considering Winona Ryder and Sean Astin to play the parents. We did a poll and we found out that in Stranger Things, 
They became super popular together, and everybody wanted to see them on screen. So their values went up together. Um, so then we were like, oh, this is awesome. So then we decided to approach Henry Winkler uh, for Santa Claus, and he said, now that's an interesting idea. And in my head, I went, ho, 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 hey. You know? <laughs> so we are looking for seven million. We have 500,000 on the table. And we are also looking for distribution. And if you want to come and find me after, we'll give you some more information. Thank you very much. And remember, Remember, this is just a little bit, like what you're seeing right here is just a little bit of what you'll be able to see when you do the QR code tomorrow and you look and there's a lot more predictive analysis that will give you even more information to make exciting decisions on how you're going to support all of these creators. Um, Nick Clark is coming up next for the underground pieces. Nick Clark is a NYC-based musician and filmmaker whose work has encompassed film, TV, and web. He has extensive experience editing and is directing and producing with institutions like the Berklee College of Music, brands including Adobe and Staples, and iconic performers like Judy Collins and Melissa Farrick. As a lifelong musician, Nick loves partnering with other artists to help bring their songs and stories to life. His music and videos have won many, many awards. Hello. This is my excited voice. Um, real quick, I just want to say uh, much respect to we unite 11 down the street. We're uh, an industry that knows labor disputes, and so I just hope that they get everything they're working for and everything they deserve, even though it's not our fight. Um, I'm Nick Clark. My company is Odd Meter Films, and I am a musician, or I have a, a degree that says so. Um, I've been working in film in New York for about 15 years. I've edited feature documentaries that have played at festivals all over the place and TV that's aired on major networks. And in terms of directing and producing, I've made short form content of all kinds, corporate marketing, narrative, music videos that have won awards. And I'm the writer, director, producer of this project, The Underground Pieces, an indie drama with the low, low budget of 677,000. Uh, it tells the story of Mimi, a genius violinist and composer from Japan that, who agrees to marry her best friend Wes in order to hopefully stay in the country after her student visa expires. When I was a student, the Royal Tenenbaums had just come out, and I still think all these years later about the scene where Owen Wilson, the cowboy uh, author, asks Gwyneth Paltrow's character if she thinks he's a genius, and she says no. Because when I was a freshman, I was surrounded by future Grammy winner Esperanza Spaulding, jazz legend Hiromi Uhara, and I realized very quickly I was not going to be a genius on the guitar. But I loved the environment I was in. I was surrounded by people from all over the world who were practicing music and making art of all kinds, and some were so dedicated that they did agree to these green card marriages so that they could hopefully stick around. I was even asked to do this once, and it was really, really difficult, but I declined because it would have been a disaster for both of us. <laughs> so we're going to tell a story about the love of the joy of playing music with other people, about growing up and learning that even if you're passionate about something, you might not succeed, even though I'm trying. Uh, and if you love someone, they may not love you back. It is a girl power on a dais, it's vertigo on a college campus, it's gonna sound quick and witty like the Coen brothers, and it's gonna look delirious and romantic like Wong Kar Wai. And if all of that means anything to you, we should definitely talk. Um, with the New York tax incentives and with, the, with some in-kind donations that we're getting for post-production, our actual budget is just 498,000. And because I've been doing this a long time, I know that we can put something on the screen that's gonna look like many, many times that modest budget. Um, the Largo analysis says that even in the average case scenario, we have a chance for a 10X ROI on our small budget. We have a fantastic development team around the project, uh, a, an award-winning composer, a Grammy-nominated music supervisor who are gonna make it sound incredible. And I think we have a great opportunity to make a really cool, really unique, great-sounding project and would hope to talk to you later. Thank you so much. I get so excited when my filmmakers know their 10x value. That's amazing. Um, next is Marina Schroen is going to come up for Fruit of Our Womb. The Blacklist also said this is an excellent, excellently written and seamlessly transitioning film. The short film preceding the feature 
also did very well in the festival circuit. And here to pitch is Marina Schron, who is a very accomplished and award-winning short filmmaker born in Russia and based in NYC. She is most well known for her writing for stage, screen, and TV. She's also a Fulbright scholar and teaches screenwriting and film at the New School University. Well, thank you for the introduction. I guess I don't have to go into all these details. Uh, uh, just to repeat, I'm Marina Schron. Uh, I'm here to introduce my new feature film as a writer-director. It's titled The Fruit of Our Womb. Uh, it's actually an expansion of my, one of my award-winning shorts. And I'm one of the producers uh, with my company, Cuckoo's Nest Films. So, uh, The Fruit of Our Womb is uh, a psychoerotic thriller. Uh, it's a feminist psychoerotic thriller. It tells a story of a uh, a mysterious teen, uh, a girl who kills her abusive father and unexpectedly finds a new home with a wealthy couple hell-bent on having a picture-perfect family. Christina is 15, but her past is already filled with trauma. She was raised by her father to trade sex for love and protection. She never knew her real mother. Lynn, on the other hand, uh, comes from privilege, but she's also a cancer survivor who longs to be a mother. Uh, these two women have nothing in common for these unspoken desires, and they quickly form a deep bond. Joe, Lynn's husband, is caught in the middle. He uh, completes this strange family triangle. So, I call this Lolita for the New Millennium. Um, the script uh, has received some uh, accolades. Most recently, it was a finalist at the uh, Austin Film Festival uh, script competition. It's about to be published this fall, uh, and critics describe it as shocking yet cathartic uh, with complex characters. Uh, and we are targeting uh, Rachel Weisz uh, for the role of Lynn and a talented newcomer, a Bulgarian actress for Christina. Our budget is pretty lean. It's $1.2 million with about 300K coming back, coming back in tax rebates. We plan to shoot uh, the film in New York and Belgium to take advantage of European film subsidies. Uh, Largo analysis confirms that uh, the film will appeal to a wide range of audiences, uh, drawing in uh, younger crowds, especially uh, between 18 and 30. Uh, this is the film that will combine the intimate feel of Moonlight with the urgency of Sound of Freedom and the uh, social resonance of such classics as Taxi Driver. So uh, we are trying to set the bar high while uh, also keeping the costs low. Uh, that's the idea. Uh, above all, this is a necessary film. There are almost five million people worldwide, uh, worldwide today who are victims of sexual exploitation. It's a $99 billion industry. Uh, our film will tackle the issues of trafficking and child sex abuse, uh, but in both obvious and hidden forms. It will examine family, a sacred institution that way too often breeds such abuse. It will explore motherhood and the trappings of privilege. It will tell a raw and unapologetic story that will store your emotions, provoke some reflection, and hopefully spark change. Uh, so if that <coughs> sounds like something you want to come on board uh, with, please see us after this meeting. Thank you. Okay.
I want to make sure we have enough time. And we are also ending out so strong here. So please just give me a minute to introduce Deborah Pratt and Orr River. So closing out so strong here, Deborah Pratt brings 50 years of industry credits. After winning a national talent search and coming to entertainment under an NBC contract, she brings extensive experience and unparalleled institutional knowledge, a five-time Emmy nominee, a Golden Globe nominee, a recipient of the Lillian Gish Award from Women in Film, the Angel Award, the Golden Block Award, five Black Emmy nominee awards. She's also an alum of the prestigious AFI DWW program and has sold her feature scripts to WB and 20th Century Fox Animation. She is a published novelist who is ready to direct Orr River. Hello, everyone. I'm obviously not Deborah Pratt. You can see the resemblance, but you know. Um, no, our director, Deborah Pratt, ironically, has lost her voice. So um, we're praying for her quick recovery. Um, and I have a question for you today. And no, it's not to ask you for money. Um, my question for you is, if you've ever lost someone, even yourself, are they really gone? Now ponder that. So what we have in Ore River, I mean, this is the story of Paige. And Paige is a guidance counselor in the astral plane. Now imagine Everybody in the astral plane, the guidance counselors, these are for the teens. They've got, all got five stars above them because, you know, you want someone with a five-star review, right? Well, Paige, poor Paige, she's got two stars. She's trying. She feels a little lost herself. And so she may not be the best person to actually help people, or is she? And well, surprisingly enough, we're relying on her in 200 years to save the universe. Now that makes sense, right? So, Paige, her dream is to go back to her home planet, which is the Violet Planet. And to get there, she has to win the lottery to return to Earth, find the portal to get home. Because that's all she's ever dreamed of. Now, I hate to tell you this, but there is no Taco Bell in the astral plane. So don't expect that. But good news, there's a 7-Eleven. <laughs> and 7-Eleven is where you go to get your lottery ticket. So Paige is assigned a young man who comes there, uh, Kevin. He's 15. And he's very concerned. He's taken his own life. Um, he's He's had a lot to deal with. He's lost his dad recently, and uh, his mom is not doing very well. Uh, they're Italians. They're, um, her parents own a bakery, of course, in Brooklyn. And so Kevin wants to do anything he can to help out his mom. He's so concerned about his mom. And so what he does, he, he of course is a genius, he's good at hacking everything, and so he hacks the lottery system to send Paige, his guidance counselor with her two stars, to go back and help his mother, Sam. And little does he know that there is actually a plan for his mother, Sam, and Paige, in another of Sam's lifetimes, to actually save the universe but it's 200 years, so it's supposed to be 200 years later. So everybody's freaking out in the astral plane. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Um, Ishka, the leader, is like, oh, my gosh, I've got to stop this. She does everything she can to try to stop this. Well, what happens is that um, Paige and Sam end up teaming together. We're going to see what they do. And I want you to know about this. What I want you to know about this film, we've, we've got some really great things going for it. Um, there's so much diversity in this cast. We're looking at Queen Latifah to be our headliner, bring in Benedict Wong, and wanted to let you know as a last word that we do have a commitment from Diane Warren for a theme song, and this is endorsed by George R.R. R. Martin. So, thank you.
So please don't forget the card. Don't forget the card that was on your seat. It has the QR code that you're gonna go back to tomorrow so you can learn more about these projects and look at all of the different, the financials, the, the emotional intensities, all of the different types of analysis as Largo continues to grow. And I wanna thank Largo so much for the work that they are doing, making this industry more equitably accessible for you to be able to show the value of your work, of your films, of your stories, of who you are and what you're trying to do. So AFM, thank you so much for giving this platform to Largo and what they're doing. And thank you all for your pitches. They were incredible. Seriously, thank you for your work and I'm grateful for you.